Rachel, did you watch VeggieTales growing up? No? Well, I was impressed with your uh, pronunciation of all the names in that chapter, and I was wondering, you know? I have to be. You have to be a single. <laughs> oh, is that why, huh? <laughs> well, good morning, church. My name is uh, Kyle, and I am a covenant partner here at Gospel City Church, and the church has also asked me to serve as an elder. If you have a Bible, I hope you do open it up to Daniel chapter 1. I will not be rereading through the passage this morning. Rachel has done a fine job of that, but I hope you keep your eyes in the text as we go through this passage. So today we begin a new series in the book of Daniel. We will spend 10 weeks preaching through this book, doing about one to two chapters per, per week. Now the title of this series is God Reigns. Do not compromise, do not cower. You see, the book shows over and over that God works in a world where cultures are in conflict. Even though the world outside may seem chaotic and confusing, God continues to work, sometimes overtly and sometimes covertly. In KL... Here in KL, each of us daily face this clash of cultures. We see it all around us. Sometimes this clash is through language or politics or religious beliefs. And so as we think about this in our world today, how can we navigate these clashes so that we do not compromise our Christian witness? Furthermore, in societies where cultural dynamics are constantly changing and shifting, we might fear how things will look like in the future. What is it then that gives us hope so that we can stand firm and not cower in the face of these changes? Now, the book of Daniel discusses these issues, and it does so in a very unique way. You see, the book of Daniel is a very unique book. It was written sometime after the Babylonian exile, which ended in 539 BC. The exile was when God's people were removed from the promised land and forced to live in Babylon for 70 years. Now, the book was written after the exile, but it tells stories and recounts visions that are set during the exile or shortly thereafter. Unlike other books in the Bible, Daniel, it's written in two languages. The first chapter and the final five chapters are written in Hebrew. The second chapter through the seventh chapter are written in Aramaic. We also have very early translations of the book into Greek with various additions to the stories that we Protestants do not consider scripture. The book is also unique because it's written in two distinct styles. This is unlike most of the books of the Bible. So Daniel's, Daniel chapters 1 through to 6 are theological narratives. These are stories about the life of Daniel and his friends while they lived in Babylon. These stories show how God worked through Daniel and his friends as they served in the king's courts. But chapters 7 through to 12, these are apocalyptic. These are chapters with visions of God breaking into history. They describe beasts and divine messengers who reveal and explain events to Daniel. They're very different than the first six chapters of the book. Finally, the book of Daniel is unique because chapters 1 through to 6 are written in the third person, where it's writing about Daniel and his friends. But chapters 7 through to 12, even though they have a third-person framework, they are written mainly in the first person, 
I, Daniel, saw these things. So this is a very unique book, and so from now until May 12th, we will consider the stories in Daniel 1 through to 6, and then from May 19th until June 16th, we will consider the apocalyptic passages. But today, we are just looking at Daniel chapter 1. The major themes of the book arise quickly. We see in Daniel 1 the sovereignty of God in and through a clash of cultures. What I want us to ultimately see this morning is that when God's people find ourselves out of context and torn between cultures, God remains at work, even in cultures that seem to oppose him. Now, if you look at Daniel 1 in your Bible... The chapter can be broken into three sections. Depending on your translation, the the breakup of this chapter is different, but here is how we are going to look at it. The first section comes in verses 1 and 2, where we see the clash of cultures and are given the historical reasons for that clash. The second section comes in verses 3 through 8, where we see the temptation to compromise. Then in verses 9 through 21, we see peaceful resistance from God's servants. So let's look at our passage this morning, where in the first two verses we see the clash of cultures. Now the book of Daniel begins with a theological conflict. We see this conflict at the very beginning of the book. Nebuchadnezzar, the great military warrior of Babylon, has laid siege to Jerusalem. He's taken uh, Judah's king Jehoiakim captive, and he also took captive many of the elite families from Judah. But this is not merely an historical event. It was a theological event. You see, in the ancient Middle East, when a nation conquered another nation, both sides interpreted this battle as though their God was victorious or their God lost. Most of the ancient Middle East would have looked at these events and said that Marduk, the high God of Babylon, had defeated Yahweh, the provincial God of Judah. That's the way that these wars were thought about. Notice how verse 2 mentions that some of the items from the Lord's temple were plundered and brought to the idolatrous temple of Marduk in Babylon. Notice even the theological language in the description of Babylon. It doesn't refer to it immediately as Babylon, but as Shinar, which is a reference to its ancient name. The name Shinar first appears in Genesis chapter 11, when a rebellious people try to build a temple for themselves with a tower that reaches to the heavens. We call this the Tower of Babel. The word for Babel and the word for Babylon are the same. Notice the refrain in the final two lines of verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar brought these items to the temple of his God and set them in the treasury of his God. Make no mistake, this is a theological event. But this theological event is also a theological problem. John Calvin, the great reformer, states the problem well. He suggests that God's people would have asked, quote, Where is God if he does not defend his own temple? End quote. If God were real, wouldn't he defend his own temple? Wouldn't he prevent an idol worshiper from? 
like Nebuchadnezzar from breaking into his temple and taking items back to his own idolatrous temple? If God were real, wouldn't he have prevented Nebuchadnezzar from taking Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and others captive and bringing them back to Babylon? And yet the text itself emphasizes that Babylon carried various items away from the true God's temple and placed them in the temple and treasury of Marduk. But our passage also subtly answers this theological problem. Look in your Bible. Notice the beginning of verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. On the surface of history, one could suppose that the strength of Babylon had defeated Judah. One could suppose that Judah's God, Yahweh, had been defeated. But the surface of history rarely tells the whole story. And that's what this passage wants us to see. Behind the events on the surface of history, the Lord worked to bring about his purposes. And what are those purposes? Well, back in the books of 2 Kings or Jeremiah and many others, these books make clear that God actually used Nebuchadnezzar to judge Judah. In ancient times, God had made a covenant with the nation of Israel God had later made a covenant with the kings of Israel. And in this covenant, it was expected that Israel would keep God's law to receive God's blessing. But if they did not keep God's law, they would receive God's curse. Important passages like Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 warned that the ultimate curse on Israel would be exile. It would be her expulsion from the promised land to stay in a land of idols, where she would, re- where she would remain until the land had rest from her idolatry and she fully repented and turned to the Lord. So this shows us That the theological problem was not that Judah's God had been defeated by Babylon's God. The theological problem was that Judah had been judged by their God for not keeping God's covenant. Judah needed to learn how to repent. And this explains why God gave King Jehoiakim and some of Judah's elite into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. It also explains why after they continued to rebel, about 15 years later, Nebuchadnezzar would return and destroy Jerusalem, including the Lord's temple. But we see that beneath the surface of history, the Lord worked covertly. Now, these first two verses set the stage not only for our chapter, but for the rest of the book. How does it look like to live in a clash between cultures where God is working subtly behind the scenes? Well, we see the first illustration of this situation in the story that follows. So look in your Bibles at verses 3 through 8, where we see the temptation to compromise. Daniel's story begins in exile. Now, the Bible doesn't describe how Daniel arrives in Babylon. Instead, the story begins with Nebuchadnezzar's palace master, or maybe innkeeper, who is instructed to bring some of the royalty and nobility of Israel into the king's court to learn the Babylonian language and the Babylonian culture. However, They must not merely be royalty or nobility. They need to be the elite of the elite. 
Look in your Bible at verse 4. The text emphasizes their fitness to serve in Babylon. Notice the list of traits that are mentioned. First, they must be young men. Now, this cuts off half of the population at the beginning. Now, the ESV chooses a gender-neutral term here, youths, but here the term can only actually mean young men, as the NIV, CSB, and others translate it. Furthermore, notice that these young men must be free of any physical handicaps. They must be good-looking, skillful, and intelligent. Daniel and his friends would have been quite exceptional young men. And their training, it included the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. Now, this Babylonian language, the language of the Chaldeans, had ancient roots. And it has some similarities to the Hebrew, which would have still been spoken in Judah, or the Aramaic, which is what most people in Babylon on the street would have spoken. But to learn and study Babylon's literature and their language would have been a special privilege for only a very small portion of the people. Estimates vary, but well less than 5% of people in Babylon could read. Of that 5% who could read, only a handful could read the language and literature of the ancient Babylonians. To do so was a high honor. Even the later cultures who conquered Babylon, Persia, and Greece, after they came to rule Babylon, they would honor those who had this skill. They still wanted scribes in their court who could read the ancient philosophy of Babylon. This training would last for three years, according to verse 6. And then afterward, they would serve in the king's court, most likely as astrologers or wise men who would serve the king. Now, whenever I say those terms, astrologers and wise men, you're probably thinking, well, that's weird. You know, everybody knows astrology is crazy. Everybody knows those wise men didn't know what they were talking about. But those terms refer to the ancient scientists and philosophers. The scientists and philosophers, the intelligentsia of that day, were called astrologers and wise men. And those who served in the king's court were the most prestigious of the intelligentsia. Look at verses 6 and 7. These young men are given new names. We are first here introduced to the four Judahite young men. These will be the main characters for the six, first six chapters of the book. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel, do we have any Daniels in the room? I know we do. We have one or two. Daniel means God judges. Hananiah, do we have any Hananias? That would be more impressive, right? No offense, Daniel. <laughs> Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. Mishael means who is like God. And Azariah means the Lord is my helper, using the same term used to describe Eve in the Garden of Eden. These are names that uphold Israel's God. But this chief officer, translated as eunuch in the ESV, it just means officer. This chief officer gives them new names. Daniel becomes Belteshazzar, which meant to protect the life of the king. Hananiah becomes Shadrach, which meant I am made to be afraid. Azariah becomes Abednego, which meant servant of Nabu, Nabu being one of the sons of the high god Marduk. And Mishael becomes Meshach, which scholars have no idea what that means. <laughs> you got to own your L's, right? You got to own your losses. 
All right, however, back in verse 5, the text states that these exceptional young men were given some of the king's food and some of the king's wine. Now think about this, right? To eat what the king eats is a wonderful privilege and honor. This action from the king shows his great hope in the potential of these young men. However, look at verse 8. Daniel resolved to refuse the king's food. If word got out that Daniel refused the king's food, then his life would have been on the line. Furthermore, the dignity of the Israelites would have been on the line. Who do these rich kids think they are that they can refuse the king's food? Who do they think they are to refuse the honor of the king, the one who defeated their puny little nation and brought their king into exile? Such an action would have endangered Daniel's friends and even the officers who were set over him. Now, we'll discuss that more in the final section of this morning's message. But first, I want us to ask, how should we live in a world where cultures collide? Notice what we see about Daniel here. Daniel and his friends seemingly accept the names that they are given. They seemingly accept their education into the language and culture of Babylon. In fact, the chapter will later mention that they excelled beyond their peers in this education. Furthermore, they didn't resist a career in a government that opposed their people. They seem to have accepted it. Commenting on what the young men do not refuse, Pastor James Jordan notes that, quote, Daniel did not refuse to be educated in the ways of the world he lived in, and neither should we. Christians should not be afraid of becoming cultured, well-read, and wise, nor should we fear to study under unbelievers, learning what we can from them, end quote. I think there is wisdom in that statement, but it's also worth remembering that Daniel did refuse the king's food. Why did Daniel refuse the king's food? Well, notice that Daniel simply says it would defile him. Professor Carol Newsom, she says that this term suggests that Daniel was concerned that eating the food would compromise his religious identity. You see, after the time of Daniel, food boundaries would become a significant marker of Jewish identity. And so it may have been that the king's food didn't keep kosher, and eating these foods would suggest to the Babylonians that Daniel no longer served the God of Israel. But our text doesn't specify anything more than saying that Daniel resolved not to eat the food because it would defile him. Now, thinking of Daniel, I can't help but ask, what should Christians accept and what should we reject? You see, we too live in a world where cultures collide. We are faced here in Kuala Lumpur with these types of questions regularly. I believe this previous week helps provide an example to this question. How should Christians respond to Qingming? What should we do? Traditionally, Chinese use this holiday to clean their ancestors' tombs and to make ritual offerings either to their ancestors or on behalf of their ancestors. Some Christians say that these traditions must be rejected completely. They suggest that since it promotes Taoist teachings and rituals, it should simply be rejected. Other Christians say it should just be accepted. They say that you just 
go through the festival as is, you do the rituals as is in order to honor the rest of your family. They say that Christians won't have any opportunity to share the gospel with their family unless they just accept the rituals that matter to their family members. Others argue that Christians should redeem the festival, accepting the good and rejecting the unhelpful aspects. Pastor Wong of CDPC says, quote, I think it's better for Christians to visit the grave sites during Qingming and not Easter. This would signal to the non-Christian Chinese community that we Christians are also filial. We should visit the grave sites together with our non-Christian relatives. While they make offerings and sacrifices, we can pray and give thanks to God for our ancestors. We might even want to bring flowers, which are widely regarded as a symbol of respect. This provides a good time for us to share about the resurrection and the Easter message of hope, end quote. Now, there is no passage in the Bible that talks about how Christians should respond to Qingming. There's also no passage in the Bible that speaks about yoga, playing Pokemon Go, reading Harry Potter, whether Christians should offer bribes whenever the society expects it, whether Christians should attend the weddings of unbelievers, or any of these other contested issues. When faced with these questions, our tendency is to lean toward one extreme or the other. At one extreme, and this is where I tend to lead with my heart, I tend to lean, is to set up rigid boundaries. We tend towards rules that have clear boundaries and suggest that anyone who crosses those boundaries, well, they become sinners. Some of us will set up these clean and clear lines between ourselves and others where we see ourselves as moral and them as immoral. At the other extreme, are those who ignore the boundaries. They suggest that God is love and would certainly accept whatever people would do. Those of us in this camp like to push the boundaries of what's acceptable because we want to do what is most pragmatic in the situation. But a better, ex a better response comes from Daniel's example. There are areas where Daniel accepted the Babylonian culture, but there was also a line which he would not cross. And so for us, the answer probably comes between the two extremes. But the question arises, how do we determine what that line is? And do you know how the Bible answers? Wisdom. The biblical answer is wisdom. During our preacher's call on Monday evening, someone suggested that Malaysians don't like this. Malaysians are often like, just tell me what to do. But that won't work in these types of situations. There are not clear moral boundaries. So making a wise decision first requires living a life of prayer, studying God's word, meditating on the truths of the gospel, and living within a Christian community so that we are shaped into the type of people who can wisely navigate these situations. So how did Daniel navigate this difficult situation? Well, in the remainder of the chapter, we see that he navigated it through a strategy of peaceful resistance. We see this in verses 9 through to 21. Daniel suggests a test to honor the king while rejecting his food. But look at verse 9. The first thing that the author of Daniel reminds us when we, open, or when we look at this section is that God continues to work covertly through the situation. Daniel has requested to abstain from the king's food and made his desire known to the chief officer. But at the beginning of verse 9, we are reminded that God worked through these events. 
God had given Daniel favor and compassion with the chief officer. These two terms denote commitment and care. God had caused this chief officer to care for Daniel and show commitment to him. And this concern motivates the chief officer's comments that he wants Daniel to grow strong like the other young men so that he can excel in this program. Now, why would the chief officer think that the king's food would promote growth among these young men? Well, the most obvious reason is that the king's food comes from the king's table, which is the best selection of food in all of Babylon. The king eats better and more abundantly than anyone else. For Daniel to refuse the lavish food of the king threatened that he may not eat as abundantly or as richly as the other young men. But notice that the chief officer also fears for his own life, right? If these young men don't successfully complete the program or come across as insubordinate to Nebuchadnezzar, the chief officer suffers the consequences. Whether or not he's speaking literally that his head would be chopped off, he certainly knows that the consequences of Daniel's decision would be very severe. And so Daniel wisely proposes a test. Daniel also seems to recognize the seriousness of the request. Instead of further discussing the matter with the chief officer, notice that he proposes the test to the overseer who had been assigned to Daniel and his friends. Now, there are, there are a few important points to consider about Daniel's test. First, notice that Daniel proposes a time limit. How long? What's it say? Ten days, Ten days right? How much can a diet change someone's bodily composition in 10 days? Well, you might actually be surprised. People often boast about the outcomes of their new diets after only a week or two because they have cut water weight and even dropped a few kilos. Furthermore, if you think about it here, the other young men would have eaten lavishly from the king's table. So a diet of vegetables and water would amount to a serious caloric deficit. Both in the ancient world and in today's world, we recognize that young men who made such a change in diet for 10 days would probably get smaller. They will not get larger and stronger. But the second thing I want us to see is that Daniel never focuses on the content of the diet. He only says seeds, which is nuanced in our translations into vegetables, but seeds probably refers to any seed-bearing fruits or vegetables. And then he drinks water. Now, sometimes people have proposed Daniel's diet as the model diet. Some people have used it to justify veganism. Others have used it as a diet method to lose weight. But this passage does not suggest either of those things. The point is that Daniel is suggesting a diet that would contrast the king's provisions. The, the differences between the two diets would be so stark that anyone would recognize a difference. Thus, if these Israelite men grow young or grow strong and fit, it must be that God has blessed them. And in that situation, the chief officer wouldn't enforce them or force them to eat the king's food. So you may choose veganism for a variety of ethical or health reasons, but don't use Daniel as support. That's not the focus of this passage. The point is the difference between the king's provision and their proposed diet. 
And so notice verses 14 to 16, the narrative moves quickly. The test happens, the results are evident. Not only are the young men still healthy, but they are healthier and larger than their peers who ate from the king's table. Despite appearances and expectations, once again, the story shows us that God remains in control. Babylon may hold all of the political power, but God is working covertly to bring about his purposes throughout this story and throughout the remainder of the book. And so at the end of verse 16, the steward determines he will remove the king's food from their diets and let them move forward with vegetables. But the main point is not that they have a new diet. The main point is that they are able to continue to serve in the king's courts while remaining religiously faithful. Professor Wendy Witter, she summarizes this section well. She says, quote, The Babylonian king does not ultimately rule over Daniel and his friends. They are subject to a more powerful king whose subtle gifts demonstrate his faithfulness to his people and his power over a formidable king, end quote. And so at the end of the chapter, the Lord continues to prosper the four young men. And so if you look at the final five verses, they are all about God's continued work through these young men. For the third time in our passage, if you look at verse 17, it says, God gave. In this instance, God gave great learning and skill in all literature and wisdom to Daniel and his friends. I would note that this is an explicit vindication of learning the literature and ways of even those who oppose God's people. We might equate it today to what some might call secular learning or secular education. Much of the literature that Daniel studied would even have been pagan in nature, yet the Lord prospered his learning. God gave these young men learning in these areas, and it says specifically that God gave Daniel great skill in the interpretation of visions and dreams. And so I believe that we can assume that Daniel continued to navigate faithfulness in the next three years of study. And so at the end of their program, Nebuchadnezzar spoke with them and found none as gifted as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Notice that it even uses their Judahite names. Judahites can faithfully serve in a pagan government in ways that honor their authorities, but also remain faithful to the Lord. In fact, verse 20 states that these young men appeared 10 times as helpful to Nebuchadnezzar as the other magicians and enchanters of his kingdom. Now, I want you to look at the final verse. Pay close attention. It is significant. Daniel remained in the king's court until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, our story this morning is set in 605 BC. This was the year when King Nebuchadnezzar rose to the throne. He remained king until 562 BC. From 562 BC until 539 BC, four more kings ruled over Babylon. I'm not going to get into the details of those kings. But the point is that Daniel remained faithfully serving in the king's court through each of those reigns. And then in 539, Cyrus takes over and Daniel is still serving faithfully almost 70 years after our story. What then is the point? Well, the beginning of our passage today, if you look back at verses 1 and 2, 
They set the stage for a theological conflict between Babylon's gods and the Lord. Daniel, the Lord's servant, outlasted King Nebuchadnezzar. And not only Nebuchadnezzar, but all of the kings of Babylon. From the surface of history, Babylon is in control. But if you look beneath the surface of history, the Lord's hand is constantly working to bring about his purposes. Professor Chun Leong Xiao summarizes, quote, The God who brought about the exile is the very same who enabled Daniel and his friends to survive and even to thrive amid a hostile environment. This story is about God's sovereignty, end quote. So how do we navigate situations when we find ourselves out of context? Well, from our passage this morning, we have seen when God's people find ourselves out of context and torn between cultures, God remains at work, even in cultures that seem to oppose him. And so this morning, I want to suggest that as Christians, we are all out of context and caught between cultures. I'm obviously out of context as an Angmo, as a Matsale. I don't know the Tamil word. You'll have to teach me later, right? I'm obviously, but we are all out of context. You see, we live between the culture of the kingdom and the cultures where God has placed us. The New Testament describes our situation in a variety of ways. 1 Peter 2 refers to Christians as sojourners and exiles. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 refers to Christians as ambassadors for Christ, who represent, who represent the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling a lost world to Christ. We are all, if we are in Christ, we are all representatives of Christ's kingdom. And we live in a culture and in cultures that do not yet recognize that God's kingdom is coming. In Philippians 3 verse 20, the Apostle Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom that has not yet come to earth. It will someday come to dwell on earth, but that has not yet happened and will not happen until our Lord Jesus returns. And so right now, Today, in Kuala Lumpur, you and I are all living out of context. And in the midst of this situation, like Daniel, we are placed in out-of-context situations to represent the true king. We are placed as agents of God's kingdom in cultures that do not yet know him. How should we think about our situation so that we can faithfully represent Christ while also living in cultures that don't yet know Christ? The first thing I would want us to think about is this. No matter how corrupted by sin, we must remember that God still loves and affirms his creation. The heavens still declare the glory of God. Humans still reflect and represent God's image. Imperfect justice still dimly represents God's justice. No matter the situation in which God has placed us, there are still positive aspects of God's created order that we can affirm. Reformed theologian Al Walters says, quote, through God's goodness to all men and women, believers and unbelievers alike, God's faithfulness to creation still bears fruit in humankind's 
personal, societal, and cultural lives, end quote. In other words, even in a fallen world, we see hints of God's common grace all around us. Just like Daniel, we can joyfully affirm the aspects of God's grace that remain evident even in fallen workplaces, societies, families, and other institutions. But second, and this one is just as important, we must also remember that all things created by God have also been corrupted by sin. Another Reformed theologian, Cornelius Plantinga, says this, quote, When people devise and defend high-minded political fraud, when a musician feels a spasm of happy satisfaction over the negative review of a colleague's album, when a drug dealer wants and plans the hooking of a fresh customer, when a teenager scolds his confused grandmother, when we put other people on a tight moral budget while making plenty of allowance for ourselves, when we human beings do these things, we exhibit a corruption of thought, emotion, intention, speech, and disposition. Brothers and sisters, sin pervades every aspect of our lives and every aspect of the world around us. It affects how we think, act, feel, and relate to others. It has corrupted both individuals and institutions, families, the marketplace, education, and every other institution has been corrupted in some way by sin. Therefore, even as we affirm the goodness of God's creation, the goodness of those aspects of creation that still glorify God and show us his common grace, we must not accept the aspects of that same world that have been corrupted by sin. You see, for Daniel and his friends, there was a line that they would not cross. To eat the king's food meant that they compromised their faith and became defiled. Our situation today will probably look different. But in each of our situations, we must respond to biblical, with biblical wisdom, affirming the goodness of God's creation, recognizing his common grace, while also rejecting the corruption from the fall. And as we work through these challenging situations, in the places where God has placed us, we should not lose hope. The gospel teaches that God in his love sent Jesus to live a perfect life that we couldn't live, to die on the cross for our sins, and to rise from the dead so that we have hope of eternal life. The grace of God that flows from the cross and from the empty tomb, it has the power to cleanse us. It has the power to remove every aspect of sin that has corrupted the world around us. In fact, that's what the Bible says it will do. All of sin will be done away with. God's grace in the gospel of opposes sin and seeks to remove it from God's creation. God's grace in the gospel seeks to renew and restore all of creation to its proper order. And just like Daniel, God covertly works in our world to place you and I as his agents of grace, his ambassadors of reconciliation into a variety of families, workplaces, and other groups, various schools, maybe in your taman or your condo. You are placed there as an agent of his grace in these places where sin still corrupts. And so, brothers and sisters, may the gospel enable us to affirm the goodness of God, 
to refuse the sinful things that are all around us and to faithfully point all peoples to the reconciling work of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the example that you have preserved for us of Daniel and his friends. We thank you for what we see in this passage of your common grace. We thank you for what we see in this passage of your sovereignty, how you work even in situations where nothing seems to, from the surface of history, to be going your way. We thank you that we know that just as in the times of Daniel, you were at work covertly, so today in Kuala Lumpur, you are at work covertly as well. We thank you that you place Daniel and his friends as agents of you in the high courts of Babylon. And I thank you that you have placed the brothers and sisters in Christ in this room as agents of your grace all across the city of Kuala Lumpur. May you give us the grace that we need to live fully, fully consumed by the gospel lives, but also so that we might point people to you, so that we might oppose injustice and sin, so that we might be the agents of grace and reconciliation that you need across this city. Give us the strength and the grace that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.